Hi, everybody. So, hopefully next year we'll have a demo reel where we can run it and show all the feature material that we're shooting that we aren't allowed to show yet because they haven't been released, um, which would be great because um, yeah, I think everybody's tired of some of those shots. So the future of the 3D business, well, obviously we, we have an outlook towards the future of this business as being a great future or we wouldn't still keep pushing away at it the way we are. So for everybody in here, it's, it's a great future in this business, despite naysayers and pessimists and people who are resistant to change. And you have to really separate this out into different areas. There's features, and then there's television, which kind of goes in features, except for live broadcast. So there's feature film, television, and then live broadcast. And those are really two separate areas with different growth paths. I don't think anybody doubts that the big business eventually is television. You know, live broadcast television, what we watch every weekend at home. But starting with features, I, I don't think that even the naysayers and the pessimists are, well, there are exceptions to that too, but say even the naysayers and pessimists are convinced now that the feature business has gone 3D. Pretty much every studio picture that is in development is considering 3D. And there's, you know, there's just so many of them, and for the first time, they're not all action movies, which is great. You know, for years we've all been saying, 3D doesn't only have to be special effects and action movies, and, you know, I don't, I'm not, you know, Baz Luhrmann is going to go make a movie that is actually nothing to do with action, you know, it's a drama. And he's going to shoot that in 3D, which is terrific. So. The feature film market has moved on, but there are some things needed for the feature film market, which you know we can talk about in a little bit. It's the same things needed for the television market. So, but first, television. It works. I mean, you know, Roland Garros is in 3D. We, you know, every major sporting event seems to be shot in 3D. B Sky B has made a great business now out of full time production and broadcast. I mean, they have a thriving business. We're building another truck because the two aren't enough. They now need a third OB unit to be shooting because they need more and more and more content, which is really the story of television. It needs more content. And a lot of people ask if I'm disappointed at the sales of 3D television. You know, only three million units sold last year. I, I think that's incredible that three million units sold last year. Uh, you know, it's the first generation. There's not a lot to watch, and yet three million units sold. It's television, you know, from a 40,000 foot view is going to be chicken and egg. There's three million units, and now people will make a little more content. A little more content will sell more televisions. More televisions will inspire the making of more content. Whoever thought it was going to be an overnight transition and so they're disappointed in sales, I, they're smoking something. It's, you know, it's never an overnight transition. The transition from 2D digital television to 3D digital television is happening faster and will happen faster than the transition from analog to digital or the transition from, you know, DVDs to Blu-ray. I mean, that, that transition took years. So for anybody to think that the 3D transition to televisions is going to take less than five years, they're crazy. It's not going to take less than that. It's going to keep growing, and those of us in this business, everybody in this room, will all find ways to stay in business during this growth until eventually it's the industry that we all joined this for. And so, you know, the trick is just staying in business while this industry grows. What's holding back? Uh, I can keep going. Yeah, yeah, but I've got a question I think to, to go through. Uh, the method and the techniques you develop uh, in first for uh, 3D live acquisition uh, for football or baseball, thing like that. do you think it's possible to use uh, these tools for feature movies? Yes. So, let's, so a few words about technology and then we'll tie it to feature movies. To me, what's holding back the broadcast world is the cost. It's hard, hard, it's hard to make a business case. You can make a business case for satellite distribution, kind of. 
are for disk distribution, kind of. It's very difficult to make a business case for terrestrial distribution because that requires advertisers, and advertisers don't have enough eyeballs, so they're not signing on for it. You can't really charge more. So it really comes down to, in any of those mediums, lowering the cost of production. Right now, for a live sporting event, you know, on this side of the field there are the 2D crew, and on this side of the field is the 3D crew. So your costs are all, not just doubled, they're almost triple the cost of just a standard 2D broadcast. There's no business model that will sustain that for very long. It's cool during the experimental phases, and it's great that some of the big manufacturers, you know, the Sonys and the Panasonics, and the Samsungs of the world have stepped up to pay for some of this, but those are not, that's not a sustainable business model. In television, there's, a couple, there's one golden rule. You know, this rule is, you can't violate this rule just like you can't violate birth, death, and taxes. Those are real. They exist. You'll never get around them. And that rule is schedule. If you're doing a television show or a live show, you absolutely have to do it on the schedule. You know, you can't stop the action in a live show because you need to reset something on your camera. It doesn't work that way. You can't take a one-hour episodic television show that always at least in the U.S., has a nine-day shooting schedule and say, well, now we're going to shoot for 10 or 11 days. Well, what does that do to the next episode? It cuts two days from their schedule. You cannot violate schedule. So for us, that leads to technology. It was the development of technology that let us cross the threshold of schedule. And we've now done enough television shows and even episodics, which nobody's aware of, and I'll, I'll tell you why, but we've done enough of these episodics to know that we can now stick to a nine-day schedule. Production isn't losing a single shot. Every television show in the world is over-ambitious, even in 2D. They have too much they want to shoot in nine days, so the crews end up working ridiculously stupid hours. But it doesn't change for 3D. You still have the same ridiculous overachieving shows that want to shoot way too much for nine days. Same number of shots, though, can be done in 2D as in 3D. So once that threshold has been crossed, the next threshold, and, and for us it's technology that does that. Yes, we'll get to the technology part in a minute. But once that threshold has been crossed, the next is budget. And for us, technology affects the budget. To do a 3D show now requires a large, a much larger budget. Where does that budget go? It goes into equipment? Well, right now, current technology, or at least overall current technology, requires beam splitters to shoot a 3D show. Um, beam splitters have two cameras on them instead of one, so you're already spending more money because wherever you used to have one camera, you now have at least two. And the rigs and the electronics that go with it are certainly the cost equivalent of yet a third camera. So you've got three times the equipment cost. Will that change? Yes, eventually over time, but not yet. So where's the other cost? The other cost is in people. Now, an episodic show, it's not so bad. You only have a few extra people. But live broadcast, if it's a 12-camera sporting event, you're definitely adding 12 convergence pullers. That's a lot of salary. There's one of the biggest truck companies in the U.S. has estimated all in the expenses for an extra person runs them about $10,000 a weekend. Well, that, that includes salary, overtime, airfare, hotels, meals, local transportation. So when you add up all those little pieces, that's about 10,000 a person. It seems a little high to me, I'd put it more at seven or eight, but just 10 is an easy number to work with, so I'll work with that for a minute. If you have 12 convergence pullers, that's 120,000 US dollars per weekend show. That's a lot of money, and that's getting in the way of making content. So, at least from our point of view through reality, we decide, we develop technology now that eliminates that position. Convergence pulling is automatic. And if any of you came to NAB, we did three days worth of broadcast, um, eight hours a day, nonstop. It was completely automated. And I was surprised, but the picture looked better than if we had humans pulling convergence. And I, I guarantee you, eight hours a day times three days with humans pulling convergence, it wouldn't have been very good at lots of moments because you know, at some point everybody has to go to the bathroom, at some point everybody's phone rings, at some point everybody gets bored, and eight hours of shooting sports 
would get pretty boring. Computers never get bored. They're on it, they're on it consistently, and the transitions are smooth. So the picture was actually beautiful for three straight days. So the technology and the software, before everybody gets all worried about it, is it's designed to replace the automate the, the automatic functions. There's not a lot of creativity to convert this boy. There's creativity in the stereographer role. And the stereographer is telling the convergence puller where to make his settings. So there's not a lot of creativity in just turning that knob. And a computer that has really good algorithms behind it can read the 3D images and turn those knobs better than a human and more consistently. So without the convergence pullers, I know we've lowered the cost of broadcast by at least one third. It might not be enough, but it's a good start. So, you know, does that, you asked about feature films. Does that technology relate to feature films? I don't think I'd automate converges on a feature film because you only have one or two cameras. You know, and, and you're going to have at least one or two technicians there running the cameras and they can pull convergence. So there's enough crossover roles. It's really the big shows. But then there's another piece of software. One of, one of the things we're finding is it takes a highly skilled person and sometimes many hours to do the initial alignment of the cameras when they come out of the box. Well, that's a lot of hours and they're expensive hours and the person who does it is generally fairly expensive because they're highly trained. And there's software we now have that does automatic alignment. You set up a camera, it doesn't need a special target, you just aim it off somewhere where there's some foreground objects and some background objects, and in four or five minutes, the camera system is completely aligned. And aligned to a level of perfection that humans just aren't hitting, because you know the computer's looking at two or three des you know, zeros past the decimal point to make sure they're in alignment. So they're, the computer's looking for sub-pixel alignment. And I think everybody knows that with zoom lenses, we use these lookup tables to always keep the zooms going. The software builds the lookup tables as it goes. So now any camera operator, and in sports camera operators like to set up their own cameras. They don't want a 3D technician to set up their camera. They want to set up their own cameras. It's their camera, their camera position. But with the automation now, a standard OB truck can pull up with a standard crew. The camera operator could go set up his camera. It takes you know, a half hour to train him how to set up a 3D camera. And then he pushes a button and it aligns itself and now he can start operating. So these are all tools that bring it closer. Now, but on features, I wouldn't use automatic convergence, but the automatic alignment is a wonderful tool. You can start out in the morning and in five minutes all your cameras are set and ready to go. And most of the features, because DOPs like smaller camera rigs, most of the features that we're doing are being shot with prime lenses because primes are a lot smaller than zooms, which means the whole thing can shrink down and be lightweight and portable and handheld. And there's a couple other reasons for it, but you know, lens changes always took time, but with the automation now, lens changes take minutes. So you just pop two lenses on, the rig lines itself very quickly because it already has the stored information for that lens anyway, so whatever variance went on in, in the PL mount, it, it fixes pretty fast. So I, the automation definitely is starting to help in the features. And uh, you know, for me, it's about starting to automate a lot of these processes. This is an industry now that's looking for technology to solve the problems, and it's no longer enough just to have a, a fairly stable rig where you slam two cameras on it and say, hey, we can shoot 3D with this. That's okay for your own projects, but that's not what the commercial motion picture and television business is looking for. How now you, you, you describe your, your job, you're a service provider, you're a manufacturer? We used to be a service provider, and we still do some of that, but in the early days, if we didn't send crews out with the equipment, then nothing would get shot because nobody else knew how to use the equipment we were building. So we did a lot of shows. You saw all of them up there, or a lot of them. But um, we're doing less and less of that, so it's getting harder to cut a demo reel, actually. Uh, our customers are shooting more of it. So now, Triality is really a technology development company. First and foremost, then, all of our money goes into R&D teams, people writing software, people people writing algorithms. Um, there'll be some fun announcements coming up in the next three or four months, but can't, it's a little premature to mention them now, but we're a technology company. 
it, you know, I, I look at the 3D industry and I want to play in the mainstream. I want to be part of features. You know, we're, right now we're making Spider-Man, we're doing The Hobbit. Um, the Hobbit is an amazing show, we can talk about that. And tomorrow I know we're going to talk about workflow on Spider-Man and how, uh, how we're dealing with all of this data that comes off these shows. You know, there used to be one camera shooting 2K and that was a lot of data. And then it was suddenly one camera shooting 5K and well, there's a lot more data. Now it's two cameras shooting 5K and there's even more data. And now on The Hobbit they're shooting 48 frames a second, which is a new movement in Hollywood. Um, and so now that's even a lot more, there's so much data flowing through these sets and yet you, you, and you have to have pipelines to keep up with it um, or, or it just doesn't work. So yeah, it's, there's a lot of data out there right now and we have to start to. And do you think this, with uh, this um, data management, your job also is going to, to, to evolve? You are perhaps at the beginning more on uh, acquisition, but you are more uh, involved in the post-production? We're, we're not as involved as po in post-production as I would have liked this to be many years ago. And now there are some very, very good companies jumping in and building really great post-production tools. I'd like to be working more closely with them. We are working closely with some. I know we announced a while ago that we were working with SGO on, on tools for the Mystica. And, you know, I think our involvement in post is really going to be partnering with companies that are already in that business as opposed to deciding to compete with them. You know, I'd like to keep competing with areas where I know we have unique skills and we don't really have the pipeline for post tools into the market the way we do for the production side. Um, could you say a few, a few words about the um, next level, next projects, about movie where you are going to, to, to work on and also perhaps few few words about your new development? Yeah, the funny thing is you know, we have a lot of new features Spider-Man went so well, we have a lot of new feature films coming up. Spider-Man was a 2D schedule. They were going to shoot 2D and convert. So their shooting schedule was always about 35 millimeter 2D schedule. At the last minute, Sony decided they were going to actually originate in 3D. And we met with them and we convinced them, don't change your schedule, keep your 2D schedule. Don't worry about it. They worried about it, but they kept the 2D schedule. Spider-Man wraps this week. For the whole feature, and it was a very complex feature because of all the effects, uh, they're one day behind. On the earlier Spider-Man movie, shot in 35mm 2D, they were three days behind. So you could say 3D actually speeds up a movie, uh, which we'd like to say, but we won't. But we're on schedule on that. So that's driven a lot of the work towards using reality technologies on features. The Hobbit is right now in production, I think, month three, and they're dead on schedule, which is great. So that's driving a lot more features. Unfortunately, I, until the studios announce that they're making the feature in 3D, I can't talk about it, because if I say, yes, we're looking at this picture, then everybody knows it's a 3D movie, and the studios aren't quite ready to, you know, it's not up to us to announce whether a studio film is 3D or 2D. So. So I, I guess I won't, I'll, but I do want to talk about episodic television. So episodic television, you know, if the televisions are to go into the market and succeed, it needs, it needs even more content than, you know, than, than the football championships or Roland Garros or some of the big sporting events. You know, those are great, but it, more content than that is needed. And really what's needed for television is the opportunity to turn on your set every day of the week and see new content. Which means the episodic shows, the ones that you watch at night, the ones that everybody's hooked on and don't want to miss an episode of, have to start going 3D. And the, the truth is they are. And there's a great business case for it. The reason nobody knows they are is because even if shows are shooting 3D now, they're only airing the 2D version because there aren't enough sets out there yet. So the shows that are going 3D now are archiving the 3D content. They're putting it away so they can syndicate 3D next year or the year after. They're also shooting 3D so that they can release a 3D Blu-ray at the end of the season because even if you've 
recorded every one of your favorite shows on your DVR and it came out in 2D, the 3D Blu-ray is a reason to go out and buy it. So if we can stick to the schedule, which we do, then there's a great business case for doing an episodic today in 3D. The only cost is the additional cost of the equipment and one or two people, which isn't, you know, again, against the primetime episodic show, it's not a lot of money. The return on that is proven. The syndication rights in 3D will be big. The Blu-ray will be big. It's certainly today big enough to cover the cost of those shows. So I think everybody would be surprised at how many episodic shows are planning on 3D for the next season, or even started. And I know we've, we've been running crews around like crazy, and again, this is where we get into production. Um, doing, every, everybody's gonna go down the same path. Well, we wanna shoot a test. Okay, so we'll go shoot a test. Every show believes they're unique enough so that they have to shoot a test of their specific show. Doesn't matter that you did the show that's kind of like it, it has to be their specific show. So we'll do a test for everybody's specific show. The tests always turn out the same. They're amazed you can stay on schedule. And then the plans start for doing the season in 3D. That's gonna do more to drive the television business into the market than anything else. So if there's episodics available, there's a reason to buy sets. And if there's more sets in the market, then there's gonna be a lot more content needed in all areas, including the documentaries that people like to make. And including some of the smaller shows or maybe not the prime time episodics because you know the less than prime time episodics aren't going to drive it but they'll benefit from it okay everything we've ever shot in 3d i'll look at the 2d version and i'll say well that plays perfectly fine so even sporting events which we know are cut differently in 3d they're slower and they're sometimes wider i'll look at the 2d versions just to see how it would play because that's another big piece of the economics you can't have two crews on the field for much longer so, and I know ESPN has been doing a lot with the 2D, 3D polls. You have to separate out two areas. One is feature film, television, you know, episodic, and the other is live sports. Because in feature film episodics, if there is in a movie five shots that are very specific for 3D, you could shoot those five shots in a 2D version and then make a slightly different digital edit, and it's not that big a deal to do that. And I know some pictures are actually doing that. Um, but for the most part, the 3D master is also the 2D master. You can extract the 2D from it. And for those shows that can afford it, they'll, add, they'll put those other shots back in. Some won't bother because they didn't... The good news is nobody's doing the, you know, in-your-face shots to the point where that's the only reason for the shot. Yes, there are, people are doing a lot of negative parallax from point to point, but if the shot has other meaning, then it, that's okay in 2D that it was negative parallax. You just have a good foreground object. So I think that's working. But in the live sports area, there is a compromise. Everything I've looked at in 2D that came off of 3D Master, to me, works. But it's not... But I'm on a slightly different viewpoint than the guys who work at the networks, who eat, breathe, and live sports coverage every day. They see it as a big compromise. Yet, everybody's aware it has to be done, and I know ESPN is doing a lot of 3D where they're pulling the 2D and they're making it work. The 2D definitely gets compromised if you want the purest 2D point of view, but if you ask my personal opinion, my personal opinion, we've, we're using way too many cameras at sporting events. It's grown over the years. It used to be 12 cameras at a football game, now it's 30 at a football game, and in 2D it's cut, 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 cut trying to put some excitement into what might not be an exciting event. You know, in 3D, we're back to the fewer cameras, so it's slower coverage. I don't think that hurts the 2D at all, because it's less cutty, and I appreciate that. So, but there will be some compromise. The 2D will be cut slower than people are used to, and the 3D might be cut a little quicker than people are used to. And so, back to, back to technology. So we've built the tool, because this is a real problem. We've built a tool, it's an image processor that sits on the back end of the switcher. It just looks at switched output. And I think everybody's aware that in the YouTube movie we played with this technique called depth leveling where we transition depth across every edit. So the director could make their edits wherever they wanted, we'll fix the depth. And on fast editing, you have to have very smooth depth transitions that are People can't watch it. That's you know that's where the old myth you can't cut fast in 3D comes from. Of course you can cut fast in 3D. You just can't 
jump depth very fast in 3D. That's a different subject. So we have this new tool that's it's not done yet, but it's being it's almost done. We showed a piece of it in NAB that sits at the back end of the switcher and it puts a slight delay in the feed, a few frames. But what it's doing is it's analyzing the cut and it's transitioning automatically the depth to leveling across the edits. So now you can do 3D with faster cuts in a live environment and compromise the 2D a little less. 